September 7th on NEPM. New England Public Media is sponsored in part by our contributing viewers and by WPI's Business School, merging business and tech, using data-driven management skills to work, learn, and lead in a complex global business world. More at business.wpi.edu. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. This fall on PBS, Ken Burns takes on Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. An all-new season of Call the Midwife. The nurse's house, midwife speaking. Nova unlocks the secrets of the universe. We want to know what are our cosmic origins. And stories of service and beyond with American veterans. For 70 years, I never talked about it. Now I want to talk about it. This fall. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. We'll pay a visit to what is perhaps the most artistic community on the Cape, Provincetown. So you just get this abundance of sunlight hitting the area and then just spreading out and it's beautiful. We'll show you all that the city known as the Brooklyn of the Berkshires has to offer. There are art galleries, museums, theaters, performing arts, world-renowned. And we'll take you to a bookstore that's as much about community as it is about literature. We can build as a community. We can turn a sore spot into something that is like a rose. We'll bring you those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Saivalis Bauer. The light and natural coastal beauty of the outer beach of Cape Cod has inspired artists for over a century. In the final installment of our three-part series on the history and beauty of the Cape Cod National Seashore, producer Dave Frazier visits Provincetown to learn the history of this arts colony and to meet up with the Western Mass artist who has been painting on the outer Cape for close to 30 years. When I look back on, on my life and I think, this is, this is my job. I'm always telling people that, you know, I'm at work right now. I feel really fortunate. I get to go out and photograph. And every so often I step back and go, man, people, like, people are buying my work. That's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty cool. With its incredible light and colorful surroundings, the outer beaches of Cape Cod have been attracting artists for over a hundred years. At the tip, the town of Provincetown, an eclectic community that has been described as a place of contrasts, rugged and rural, with a vibrant town center. It simultaneously provides artists with opportunities for both solitude and socializing. If you ask people if they know about Provincetown, Massachusetts, they'll usually say, oh, that's that gay place where people come for carnival and this and that. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that this is the oldest continuous art colony in America. No one else can say that except Provincetown. And when you cross that line into Provincetown, you've entered into an art mecca. The tip of the cape faces north, and that north light is what you know what artists are always seeking. So if you go back when there were no artificial lights, artists would build studios with skylights and windows facing north to get that really even, beautiful light. Julie Tremblay didn't set out to be a photographer, but during her undergraduate studies at UMass Dartmouth, she took an elective in photography and recalls the first time she looked through the viewfinder of a camera and found it was like looking through the window of another world. I like really clean compositions. I don't like a lot of complication. So for me, it's about um, negative space. It's about um, getting the essence of, the, of what I'm seeing and trying to like, get, get the viewer to understand what I'm seeing. I and mean, if it's quiet, I want it to be quiet. And if it's vibrant, it should be vibrant. People come here for art. And so just being here, I get to benefit from all the people that 
came before me. And there were, you know, big, big artists that came, playwrights and writers that came before me. It's, it's just great to be in that sort of an environment. To be an artist in Provincetown means you are part of a colony. Charles Webster Hawthorne opened his Cape Cod School of Art in the summer of 1899 and taught his plein air method right on the town's waterfront. He had an influx of students that came, primarily women, who would come for a few weeks or a week and they would paint on the pier, they would paint in plein air, which means painting out of doors. Often as many as 100 people watched as he dramatically demonstrated his theory of color and effects of light on an object something artists today still recognize. The way the light bounces off the sand, the sand dunes and the sandbars on the bay. So you just get this abundance of sunlight hitting the area and then just spreading out and it's beautiful. Susan Tilton Pecora grew up in Marblehead, a seaside community on the north shore of Massachusetts. She now calls Western Mass her home but has a love for the Outer Cape and shows her work regularly in galleries along Commercial Street in Provincetown. I like architecture and nature together, not just pure nature. If I paint a, a seascape, I tend to look for some architectural element in that, and I just love the combination. This is an attractive spot because you've got the sky, man-made structures, which I love, and the water and the reflections and the beach. You have all the elements to make a beautiful painting. I've painted this scene at sunrise, sunset. I've painted this scene and had people come and buy it right off my easel. Hey. Oh yeah! Greetings from Provincetown, Massachusetts. Art is everywhere in this small, three-square-mile town at the tip of the Cape. And artists who come to Provincetown today are still looking at the same things that artists were looking at 100 or so years ago. How they depict it depends on their style and interpretation. But the landscape and the light remains the same. Any place you go walk into Provincetown, there's original artwork, whether it's a restaurant, one of the 50 or 60 galleries in this town, and if you're here to go to the beaches or go out to the dunes, that's what the art was, was inspired from. So the art is the connector between everything in Provincetown. Every Friday night, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. We close out our three-part series on the 60th anniversary of the Cape Cod National Seashore with a digital exclusive on the 3,000-acre Province Lands Reservation in Provincetown. This area is hailed as the second oldest common lands in the country, second only to Boston Common, and producer Dave Frazier takes us on a tour of this unique area of Cape Cod. I think it's a magical place, and you know, I, I've actually been telling people I call it the outback of Provincetown because it's so vast. It's thousands of acres of dunes, beaches, and forest land that stretch as far as the eye can see. And it has uh, a lot of wild animals. It's got these little dune shacks that has so much history. So we got history, we got culture, we have flora, we have fauna, we have dunes 110 feet tall surrounding us. And it takes up 75% of our entire town size is out here. Don't miss this digital exclusive available online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. The Berkshires of Western Massachusetts are a mecca for world-renowned arts and culture with dance theater and museums galore. So it should come as no surprise that the largest city in Berkshire County boasts an exciting and active cultural scene. I sat down with Jennifer Glockner, director of Pittsfield's Office of Cultural Development to discover all that the city that's known as the Brooklyn of the Berkshires has to offer. Pittsfield is the heart of the Berkshires. We are smack dab in the middle and we tell everyone that we 
are accessible to everything from Pittsfield, but also Pittsfield is the only place where you can stay downtown at a hotel and within a half mile of where you're staying, there are art galleries, there are museums, there are theaters, there are performing arts, world renowned performing art spaces, Berkshire Theater Groups, Colonial Theater and Barrington Stage has several footprints in Pittsfield. Tell me where we are and what this place is. This is the Liechtenstein Center for the Arts. We're so fortunate that it's owned by the city of Pittsfield. There are nine artist studios here. And then this is an art gallery. We rotate art shows every month, typically opening on the first Friday of the month during First Friday's Arts Walk. But we have art in our school every May, which is on the walls right now. These are Pittsfield High School AP art students. And then we have CATA Community Access to the Arts every July here. So we have shows that happen every year, but then we have um, unique shows also. The city is known for its many cultural events such as Third Thursdays and the 10 by 10 Upstreet Arts Festival. Can you tell us about those events and others that you offer throughout the year? We love Third Thursday. In than typical normal quote unquote third Thursday, it's a big street festival. The half mile downtown of North Street shuts down to cars and there's pedestrians and food trucks and vendors and entertainment. So this year we're actually doing something like that on Friday, September 17th, save the date, over at the Common, which is a, another gem in Pittsfield, this beautiful park. And we're doing a block party. The 10 by 10 Upstreet Arts Festival is a partnership with Barrington Stage. Julie Boyd, the artistic director at Barrington Stage, came to this office and said, I want to do a 10 by 10 new play festival. Every 10 minutes a new play begins. It's phenomenal. You're laughing one minute and crying the next minute, and you can't believe that there's five or six actors doing this whole thing. Now, a vibrant city usually has an active culinary scene, and it's one of my favorite things about the city of Pittsfield. What can foodies expect to find when they visit? Everything. I mean, Pittsfield, again, is just, it blows my mind, all of the international culinary experiences you can get in Pittsfield. And right here downtown, there's tapas, Mexican food, Asian fusion. We really have anything you want. <laughs> it's crazy to say that in such a small city, but it's true, the food here, the food here blows my mind. Through Artscape, the city embraces public art display. What is Artscape and what new public art projects are you unveiling this year? Artscape is a great organization and it's a committee that meets once a month. The mission of the committee is to bring public art to Pittsfield, downtown and beyond. And Artscape has done some great things. We did the, the electrical load boxes got transformed to works of art and we did a call for art for those. There is a beautiful mural on top of the Lantern building called The Sun Will Rise and it's gorgeous. Over the next six to eight months, there will be more murals popping up in Pittsfield for sure. How important are the arts and the creative economy for the city? It is the city. It sparks the economy to thrive. The arts and the creative economy is what makes Pittsfield what it is. And then it's the ripple effect. They go out to dinner, some stay for the weekend, they go for coffee at the local coffee shop. I would say it's a key part to Pittsfield. And how is Pittsfield leveraging arts and culture to create a healthier, better represented and more equitable city? The creative economy and arts in Pittsfield is diverse and it always has been and we strive to pay attention to that in everything that we do and it's just an amazing thing that Pittsfield has. Pittsfield's Office of Cultural Development is the oldest of its kind in the county. Talk to me about the history of this office and why it's important for municipalities to have a cultural facilitator on staff. It is unusual around the country to have a municipal office of cultural development. And we are very thankful every year that the city councilors and the mayor and the city staff continue to say, yes, we want this. And here in Pittsfield, the city of 44,000 in Western Massachusetts, we have it and we're thankful. 
In 2004, Z. Johnson converted the first floor of a dilapidated former drug house into a comfortable, safe place for people to browse through more than 500 books. Since then, Olive Tree Books and Voices has become a beloved community center in the predominantly African-American neighborhood of Mason Square and is just one of a handful of black-owned bookstores in Massachusetts. Producer Dave Frazier visited Olive Tree and brings us the story. I promise to work hard and do what's right. A book can provide a number of things. It can provide comfort. It can provide growth, certainly. It can change attitudes. It can create self-awareness. It can allow you to exchange ideas. It's a chance to really have some introspectiveness too. You know, really think about who you are as a person and what it is that you want to do uh, with your own life. This was an abandoned building and, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that it was, you know, a building of uh, less desirables. It was a former crack house. I remember distinctively one neighbor uh, watching me and uh, said to me, are you going to, you know, buy that place? Are you going to rent that place? You know, I've seen you over here a couple of times. And I turned to her and said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it. And she said, praise God, because, you know, we want that sore uh, spot to be out of our neighborhood. <laughs> it's more than just a bookstore, though. It's a community, you know, and it's a family. And I think that's why I tend to want to hang out here, because it is like a family. Usually when you walk into a bookstore, uh, there's always like the, the section of black books and, you know, black authors. But here it's the whole store, you know, the joy on the walls, the color, you know, it's, 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 it feels like home and not just uh, somewhere where you, you know, buy a book, but you also hear a story. Because I haven't done everything in life, so I'm like... One of the things that inspires me to, uh, to, to, to want to read and want to know, because when I come in here, I look around and I see so many people that look like me. I brought brought my daughter here when she was young, so for them, kids seeing people who look like them, you know, it's a, it can be inspiring. I'm a woman who has hurt as immeasurable as I have loved a child. I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, so I was able to read books about African Americans and etc. because that was my environment and world. So when I looked at Mae Jemison. When I looked at Debbie Thomas, the skater, when I looked at a number of heroes and et cetera, I could envision myself. I could say, oh, I could be that because I had a framework. It wasn't just my imagination. I had concrete evidence that these people exist. No justice. No peace. No justice. It woke a lot of folks up in terms of let me really understand other people other than myself. And then let me understand if I'm part of this problem or if I'm going to be part of the solution. Give my elbow. Okay. <laughs> so that triggered a lot of people to come into the store and to really uh, have good conversations about what should be next steps. Even though Mason Square can be portrayed or viewed as less than desirable, I wanted to be able to say, no, that's not true. We can build as a community. We can turn a sore spot into something that is like a rose. I wanted to be in a place that people could consider it their own. After the Hatfield Historical Society recognized that they only had a handful of records during the 1918 to 1919 Spanish flu pandemic, they decided to launch a website to collect stories and artifacts from residents living in Hatfield during the COVID-19 pandemic. I spoke with McGay Baker, the collections assistant for the Hatfield Historical Museum, to learn more about this collection and to also hear how a group of elementary school students contributed their stories as well. Kathy Gao is the curator of the Historical Society. And when everything shut down in March of 2020, we had to stay home. And so it was through bits of email and texting and so on. But really, Kathy's initiative as the curator of the, of the museum 
to uh, realize that we're living in really historic times and to put up this website to collect the stories of how people in and around Hatfield um, are dealing with it. So there's things up there that are artwork that people did or haiku that people have written or just reflections from various people living in Hatfield about how they're getting through. One area that has been greatly affected by the pandemic has been education, and a group of 36 students from the Hatfield Elementary School participated in a year-long project titled My History that added their experience to this COVID-19 project. How did this project come about? This started with Kathy talking to the, the teachers at the elementary school, which is conveniently pretty much across a big lawn from the museum. And so Kathy talked to two of the teachers there, Jenny Charette and Megan Millet, who um, were the sixth grade teachers, to be really forthright. This is amazing times. This is history project that they uh, that they do in sixth grade. Usually it involves interviewing someone about their childhood or researching a time in history that the student is interested in. But the teachers and Kathy mm -hmm acknowledge that right now is a, a time of history that's really important um, and that the opportunity to have a, a bunch of sixth grade students collect the you know images and data and stories of their voices and their experience is just amazing. What were the students reactions when approached with this project? Were they able to really fully grasp this historical moment and reflect on this moment that they are living in? They really were aware of it. And I think that part of that speaks to the teachers, but it also very strongly speaks to the students' ability to step up and recognize uh, like, oh, this is big because the the sort of breadth of the projects, you know, ranging from, you know, how do I Put more kindness in the world when I am unable to be around everyone. And how do I document what my family's going through? There were students that were really, really aware of political movements going on through 2020 and through 2021, um, looking at the wider world and realizing that this is a global um, pandemic and really connecting their own experience in Hatfield to the state and the country and the world. You were just touching on the breadth of the work of these students and the range. Some are digital images, videos, posters, the acts of kindness. Which submission has really stood out to you the most? Oh, goodness. Um, that, <laughs> that's a little bit like saying you choose your favorite kid. Um, <laughs> but over and over, the, the uh, two themes that really touched me were the theme of kindness and care and um, the the sense that they had that they were part of something, that um, they had a desire for this to send a message forward. You know, the the awareness that these sixth grade student ha students had of how might this help someone a hundred years from now, and they want people to know how hard this was for them, like the honesty in that, and that really really comes through in their work, those two things, that they're concerned and they want people to be safe because this was hard. One of the photos that really stuck out to me when I was looking at the website was the sign of um, the Smith Academy with the return to school date continuously pushed back. And it felt like we had so much hope that school was going to be back in session. Which photo do you think will be iconic years from now that really encapsulates the moment that we're living through? Wow, that's that's um a really great question. The image of a masked face and the little signs we see everywhere that says you know six feet distance, keep six feet distant, um, and the, and the phrase social distancing is so so potent. I definitely think that's going to be historically relevant. Pictures of a Zoom screen is going to be really relevant, but I think that in terms of like an image that conveys the emotional impact for me is spaces of emptiness where there, there's nobody playing on the playground. You know, any of the images that convey that longing for connection and recognizing the loss of it. Why is it so important to document the past and also engage young people in doing so as well? 
it matters because we we only see a keyhole into history. Um, it's impossible to encapsulate everything that has happened, um, even with a very well documented public event. And in ways, the COVID pandemic has been an extremely well documented public event. But the the private lived experience is um, so it, so puts a, puts a whole other nuance in it. It's so much more informative in a way of what was it like for these people to live through this time. Um, and especially in context with what you said at the beginning of recognizing the absence of those pieces in the 1918-1919 flu pandemic, the chance now to capture those and keep them so that we would have those records going forward, every museum around was aware of that. Do you get the sense that the students are proud of this work that they've been doing? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, this project gave them a way to process what they were going through while they were going through it. That they that they had a framework of like, oh, this is a thing that's happening. I have a school assignment that addresses this. So I feel like these specific children will have, a, I hope, will have a little bit more um, ease coming out the other side and a little more resilience because they'll already have done a little bit of processing of this is what happened. This is what my town went through. This is what I went through. This is how I documented it. And to me, one of the most telling pieces of that is where a, a child wrote, you know, I made nine pieces for this, but I kept five, you know, because it matters to them that they keep it for their own history as well. That does it for Connecting Point for August 20th, 2021. Remember, you can always find the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us again next Friday night at 6, right here on New England Public Media, for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and have a great evening. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. fathers in the tragedy of 9-11. Why did he have to go to work that specific day? They came of age in a time of social unrest. It definitely took a toll. Four